but now have found was blind, but now I see. Twas grace and come to celebrate your amazing grace lord it just it blows our mind to think of of all that you have done for us your goodness lord and your blessing that you've uh, that you've poured out upon us we're so grateful for that we're so grateful lord that we can stand here today and, and worship you openly and freely to exalt the name of jesus christ and as we gaze upon you and worship you uh, lord somehow we become more like you we pray to God that, that today that you'll be working in us, that you'll bring about all, uh, all that you desire in us to glorify you. Lord, would you do that today, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. It's so, so good to see you here uh, with a little bit of sun on your faces today, especially those who maybe helped with a car wash yesterday. Uh, but why don't you just greet each other in the, in the name of the Lord today. It's so good to have you here. God bless you. Prayer. Come, thou fount of every 
Lord, I don't think we, I don't think we understand all that you've done uh, for giving up your your throne, coming to earth as a baby, uh, humbling yourself to obedience, even obedience to death on the cross, as Philippians said. Wherefore the Father has exalted you and given you the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every tongue in heaven and on earth and under the earth one day will bow to you, Jesus. And today we posture ourselves in that way, humbling ourselves to you, recognizing you are our Lord, you are our King. Who are we that you would be mindful of us, God? We thank you for your grace in our lives, this amazing grace, undeserved, unmerited, Nothing we've ever done to deserve your great favor on us. So we love you all the more, God. We love you back. And we say thank you. Thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you for the power and strength that you give us. You've taken up residence in us. And we thank you for that today. And we praise you and and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. to him this morning. You give life. You are
mouths will cry, these bones will sing. It's all indebted to you. The fact that you've given us life, the fact that you've purchased us and given us new life, that second birth in you. What a joy it is to stand here and just offer back to you our praise and worship. And it's the breath that you've put in our lungs that we give back to you and worship and praise God. Lord, you hold the life and breath of every living, living creature in your hand, as your word says. And uh, God, we just want to pause and recognize that today. Just recognize how awesome you are and just be in awe of you, God. We thank you for your provision and, and taking care of all the little things that we would never even think of, God. You're, you're such a good uh, God of order and a God of the details. And yet the God who holds all the universes together. We just worship you today, God, and as we open up your word, may we recognize who we're hearing from today, the living word of God. May it settle on our hearts, Lord, and just speak to us. May give us spiritual eyes, spiritual ears to hear from you today, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Here we are getting ready to start a new sermon series, and I'd like to thank you all for being here. I'd like to thank our online guests for being here. You're a part of our church as well. And uh, we're gonna be taking a look at how God's word shapes our lives, how it shapes our family, and how it shapes our church. And this is a good opportunity to go through this. But you know, and first of all, as, as you're kind of opening this up, you might've looked and you see that we're gonna be in 1 Timothy. So if you've got a Bible, you can get that out. If you didn't bring a Bible, you can open it up on your app, or if you need to, you can grab one from underneath the, uh, the chair in front of you. Uh, if you're at home, feel free to open up your Bibles unless you're driving. That's illegal. I'd like to introduce you to a young man named Tim. Now, Tim wasn't necessarily all that special of a guy. He was an average person from an average town. He lived an average life. There was really not so much special about Tim. In fact, Tim actually... Tim had some things kind of working against him. Tim was uh, of mixed culture and heritage. His mother was a Jew. His father was a Greek. They're living in a country where that mattered. It was, it was kind of tough sometimes to fit in being from mixed cultures and, and, and heritages. Uh, but uh, it was difficult for Tim. And he made do the best that he could. He wasn't from an influential family. He wasn't from one of the popular families. He wasn't one of the popular kids. Uh, and so really, again, there just really wasn't all that much that set Tim out from all the other people. Uh, one day though, as Tim was hanging around town like young men do, there was this speaker that came to town, very influential man, very well-spoken, and he was sharing a message. And Tim went to listen to him because this man was talking about God. He was talking about the God. Now, Tim's mom and his grandma, they had talked to him about the God of the Israelites, so he kind of knew about some of this stuff. But as he listened to this man, the man said it in such a way that it just, it caught Timothy's heart and it caught Timothy's passion. 
And he talked about, you know, how God was in control of all things. And, and Tim Hunter understood gods, because not only had he heard about gods from his mom and from his grandmother, but there were lots of gods in this town that he was growing up in. But this man made his God seem like so much more, so much more than these other gods. He talked about his God's authority. He talked about his love for all humanity. He talked about how he had created all things. And then he talked about how man, whom God had created, actually sinned against him, how man had rebelled and turned his back against God and had separated himself from God because of his actions. And then he talked about God's forgiveness. And this has kind of, this, this got Tim's attention. He talked about a savior, one whom God had sent so that man could have a restored relationship with him. He said that this savior was a man named Jesus who came from God and was God, but lived as a man and then died, but rose again. And Tim was like, okay, now I hear you're struggling with this too, all right? Tim got it. Tim, Tim was struggling with these things as well. You're not alone there. But he continued to listen to this man. And this man well, he went on to talk about his own come to Jesus moment, if you will. He talked about how he had met this risen savior. He talked about how him least of all should the Lord appear to him. He talked about his own sinful ways and the things that he'd done wrong in the past and how God had appeared and forgiven him. He talked more about this guy. He said this Jesus came and he talked as he was sharing to all humanity. And he demonstrated through various proofs and through miracles that he was who he claimed to be. Jesus talked about sin and rebellion. He talked about death, but he also talked about forgiveness and salvation and eternal life in a place called heaven. He talked about how Jesus was falsely condemned by his own people, persecuted, prosecuted, put on trial, and caused to die. He talked about how this man was put into a tomb, and he had said that three days later he'd come out, and just like he'd said, this man came out of the tomb. But not, and then he talked to some more, and then he went back to heaven, but not before he promised them that one day Jesus said that he would return to the earth. Well, Timothy listened to these things and Tim was hooked. <laughs> Tim was like, this is good stuff. This has resonated in Tim's heart and his chest and his spirit. It just, it, it was on fire to know more and to understand who this God was, to understand this Jesus more, to understand about, about forgiveness and heaven more. And he'd heard about these things from mom and from grandma, but when, when this man talked about these things, it just, it like, it put the pieces together. It was like the rest of the story. It was like hearing the truth and it resonated and it stuck with him and he couldn't get it out of his head and he couldn't get it out of his heart. He wanted to know more. Now the man taught for a little while and eventually he moved on to the next city, but for Tim, a fire had been lit. Oh, he was excited to know and to hear about Jesus. And so he began spending more time with people in town who knew about this Jesus. And it wasn't long before Tim prayed to accept the Lord as his personal savior. He committed his life to following this Jesus, to knowing more about him. He asked for this Jesus to forgive his sins. He wanted to know more and to, and to spend time in his life serving this, this God who had died for his sin. For all the problems of growing up in this small town, a person of no specific importance, even culturally, socially, uh, kind of outcast a bit. He saw in this God, all people came together as one. He saw all people equal in this God's economy and culture and society and life and family. It was all inclusive of all people. And Timothy thought to himself, that was a good deal. In the eyes of God, those who came together in faith were one. Tim couldn't help himself. He was just blown over with this faith. The things that he had, he had been told and the things he had taught, he had to go out and start sharing with other people. He'd go up to people on the street and start telling them about this Jesus. People that wanted to know about him, sometimes people that didn't want to know about him. Tim didn't care. Tim would go up to him, talk to him anyway. Tim, there was a church that started up there in his small town. Church, he wanted to be a part of that. He got in and started serving in the church and helping out with people that were there. Well, you can imagine Tim's excitement when one day, he found out that this speaker was coming back through the area again. And this speaker actually came back to Tim's town. He was going through and he was checking on, on these small churches that had started up after the first time he came through. And when this man came to Tim's church, he was talking with the church leaders. And the leader said, you got to meet this young man. We've got this young guy that is just on fire for the Lord here. You've got to meet him. He is doing good things. He has passion. He has zeal. So they took him over and they met him. This man walked up to him. He said, hi, Timothy. My name's Paul. He shook his hand. And Timothy's knees were knocking and his hands were shaking. <laughs> I mean, wow. He was getting to meet this guy. Very exciting stuff. 
Paul, he says, I hear impressive things about you. I hear you've got a lot of zeal for the Lord. I hear that you want to serve the Lord. He says, you know what? I've got a deal for you, Tim. I'd like for you to go with me. I'm going to be going on to the next city after I leave here. I'd like for you to travel with me. I'd like you to become a student of mine. I'd like to help teach you. I'd like to help mentor you. I'd like to help disciple you and help you to grow closer to the Lord. Well, now Tim's got to make some big decisions. See, it would have been real easy for Tim to say no to an offer like that. I mean, let's face it, Timothy's a young man. This is a big decision, even a dangerous decision. What hope could a boy like Timothy have to become someone like Paul who was just sharing the Lord and going from town to town and, and bringing people to understand God and, and rising up these churches and, and helping to lead and to shepherd churches? How could a boy like, like Timothy become somebody like that? Well, the story of Timothy should be an encouraging one for all of us. We don't typically come to the story of Timothy and say to ourselves, well, no, there's an encouraging word. Let's talk about Timothy. What a great encouragement that guy is. But we really should because the story of Timothy and his rise to the position that he had is encouraging for us. The obstacles that he had to overcome. An average person from an average town who heard an amazing message and it changed his whole life. There wasn't anything special about Timothy, but there was everything special about the message of the gospel. And any one of us could be just as influential. It wasn't the work that Timothy did that made him stand out. It was his faith. It was his zeal, his desire, his passion to serve the Lord, his willingness to go out and serve others. Now, the apostle Paul had gone out Filled with the Holy Spirit, Paul had gone out and he did three big missionary journeys as Paul went around the world. And as he was going out, he was sharing the gospel, the good news with non-believers and young believers and bringing them into the, into the message of the truth. And as he went from town to town, there were small churches that gathered up, small gatherings of people. And they would meet in houses, home to home. And it began growing together. More than this, as he went out, he also started assigning elders, leaders to be over those churches, to help to lead, to shepherd, to guide, to support those bodies of believers as they came together. In the second and the third passages, as Paul was going around, it was in that second trip around that he met this young man, Timothy. He said, hey, Tim, I want you to go with me. I got something I want you to, to see. I want to show you. I want to teach you. I want to guide you. Well, you've been in Timothy for just a little bit. I want you to keep your thumb there. We're coming back. But I want you to go with me to Acts 16. Acts 16, verses 1 and 2. As Luke was writing the story, as him and Paul were traveling around, we get to this message. In Acts 16, 1 and 2, Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek, and he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul saw something in Timothy. As he came through, he saw his zeal, his commitment, his passion. I think maybe as Paul looked at Timothy, he said, you know what, this guy kind of reminds me of me. <laughs> if you know much about Paul, you know that Paul had a fervor, had a zeal to serve the Lord. Paul desperately wanted to serve his God. And he started off not necessarily doing that the right direction, but God got his attention. God got his head screwed on right, and he took all that passion and all that zeal, and he got it moving in the right direction to serve him. I think maybe he saw a little bit in Timothy of what he was doing. But the other thing that Paul understood was there's a need to mentor, to disciple, to build up the next generation of church believers, church leaders, servers, and servants continue the work of discipling. As Jesus had told him back in Matthew 28, 19, our version of the story, but Jesus told him, he said, I want you to go. I want you to disciple. I want you to make, uh, make uh, disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the, the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. Paul was living out that testimony. Now he comes to Timothy. He says, Timothy, I'd like you to go with me. Well, Timothy's got a couple hard choices to make here. In Acts 16.3, it says, Paul wanted this man, Timothy, to go with him, and he took him, and he circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Timothy was probably a teenager at these points, probably in his later teens. He said, I need you to be circumcised so you can travel with me. And Timothy said, <laughs> now, how committed are you to serving the Lord? 
Paul wanted him to do this because he understood that his father being a Greek, Timothy would be okay. He'd have, he'd have easy access talking to other Greeks about the Lord. But if he went to share, with, to share with Jews, him being born of a Jew, his mother being a Jew, that they wouldn't accept him if he hadn't followed these traditions. And so he asked him to be obedient unto this, and Timothy agreed. Acts 16, verses 4 through 5. Now they were passing through the cities... They were delivering the decrees which had been decided upon by the apostles and the elders who were in Jerusalem for them to observe. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. This is the message that, that Paul took Timothy. It's that Timothy and him went out to continue the work of, the, of the sharing the gospel. They were taking letters that the apostles had came up with in Jerusalem, and they were writing about interpretations and, and, and application for God's word in the churches leaders leading the church, and they were taking these letters out. Scripture tells us that Timothy traveled with Paul during Paul's uh, journey. He went through him with, uh, to the Corinthians, the Philippians, the Colossians, the Thessalonians. Man, what a, what a privilege. Think about this, young Timothy traveling. Think about you getting to travel with somebody. If you had an opportunity to travel and, and, and go to events with a guy like, I don't know, Billy Graham, and just be right there at Billy Graham's side as he was preparing his lessons and going out and preparing to teach those sermons, how cool would that be? Very cool, I heard from the back. <laughs> so he's excited. He's looking for this opportunity. What a privilege to learn from a man like Paul, from a guy who could humbly say, I did it all wrong, but Jesus gave me an opportunity to make it all right. So question, what does God want you and me to learn from, from Timothy, from the man and from the book? I mean, there's lots of men and women in, 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 that lived in those days, people of faith that God could have wrote to us about. What makes, what makes this so important to us? We hear the term lost to leader a lot these days and complete or completed discipleship, taking people and building them up, discipling and mentoring. It's not just a matter of just sharing the gospel and having somebody accept the Lord, but then what do you do next as far as coming alongside them and leading them to follow the Lord in the right way? And this is what Paul was doing for Timothy. Timothy knew about God and from his mother and from his grandmother, but Paul was sharing with him deeper messages, personal messages as he walked with him and talked with him and taught and instructed him and was an example to him in his life. That's what mentorship really comes down to. Mentoring isn't just telling somebody about Jesus and walking away, but mentoring is a process of coming alongside somebody else and taking them by the arm and saying, okay, wait, let's walk together and see how this works and work together. Paul was a guy that very much believed in loving Jesus, sharing the gospel with the lost, and growing the church. Paul was determined in his heart that the lost would hear the message of the gospel. Now, the message of Timothy and Paul shows us again, we all need to be intentional. Paul was very intentional about going out and sharing the gospel with others. He was very intentional about finding a young man like Timothy and saying, you know what, I want you to come alongside me, and I want to come alongside you and grow together. He wanted to continue that good work. This being Mother's Day is a good, I can't miss the opportunity. I've said it about a dozen times so far. <clears throat> that uh, it was his mother and his grandmother that were feeding these truths into young Timothy's heart and giving him an application, giving him a foundation. Moms, whether you believe it or not, your children love you. I know some mornings that may seem hard to believe or accept, <laughs> but we really do love you. And you've got our ear, and when you talk, we do listen. Yes, we do. Not, not every, all the time. But, but we have a great opportunity as parents to speak into our children's lives. Today, we, we've been talking about you mothers and your opportunity to nurture and, and help to bring up your children in the message of the gospel. As one generation passes, there's always another generation coming up behind it. It is so important to reach into that next generation. If we don't reach into that next generation, if we don't share with them these foundations, these truths, if we're not mentoring them, guiding them, leading them, directing them on how to follow the Lord, what becomes of the church? I don't care if we're talking about pastors or Sunday school teachers or children's workers or worship singers or facility staff or maintenance workers or people that go out and wash cars on a Saturday. Whatever it is that we do for our service of the Lord, all these works that we are doing, that this generation is accomplishing, are all going to have to be done again by the next generation and the next generation. It's part of our job to help bring up that next generation. 
be intentional about reaching those. And once we share the gospel and once we reach them, once we start mentoring them, remember, it's not just, it's not just a one-time gig. Once we start bringing somebody alongside with us, you know, following the Lord, it becomes a process of walking with them. It takes time. But when Timothy was ready, after having traveled with Paul for a while, Paul decides to leave young Timothy behind in a little town called Ephesus. Not really such a little town. In fact, it was actually a major port city with a lot going on. And he left Timothy there to shepherd and to be a part of the team that was leading the church there and to help to guide those churches with the things that, that Paul had shared with him. And not long after this, Paul was arrested. What a great encouragement to see your mentor arrested and sent off to jail. And yet Paul was always so strong in his faith, always being an example to those that he left behind, that even though he was being persecuted, prosecuted, new, new struggle and new, uh, new uh, strife, he was still always an encouragement to those that he had mentored and taught up, always being an example of service unto the Lord. And then he writes this letter while he's in prison in Rome to a guy named Timothy. Why do you think he wrote this letter? Well, for one thing, Remember, he left Timothy in this little town called Ephesus. It had thousands and thousands of people. In fact, it had a temple there uh, that, that honored, you know, they had lots of temples, lots of false gods in that area. One of them was to Artemis, who's also known as Diana. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and people would flock to this town to worship false gods. And this is where he put Timothy. In a town that knew a lot of struggle and a lot of strife and a lot of conflict, and here he places young Timothy. What did he want to communicate to him? Well, as we unpack this letter, as we go through this letter in the next several upcoming weeks, I hope that we can see what God wants us to learn from what the Holy Spirit led Paul to write to a man that began from humble beginnings and who was nothing special to begin with, but became a faithful follower, a servant, a protector, and a proclaimer of the word of God because of the message that he heard, because of his willingness to serve. So if you still got your thumb there in 1 Timothy chapter 1, let's get started in this. 1 Timothy chapter 1, let's pray. Father God, as we come to the book of Timothy, having met young Timothy just a little bit, we look forward to see what you will reveal to us through this book. This letter that you wrote so long ago, which is still going to have deep implication and application for us today, I pray. Lord, I, I pray that we would come to this book with an open mind, looking to see what wisdom you have for us in ourselves, in our families, and in our church for today. Though we may have read this book before, I ask that we would come to it with a new fresh heart, Lord, asking your Holy Spirit to reveal to us the truth that is applicable to us today. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's get started. First Timothy chapter one, verse one. That's a good place to start a book, is in the beginning. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Stop. Okay, we've got a whole sermon ready to go right now. So in the introduction to this, Paul does something that he quite often does. He identifies himself, but more importantly here, he doesn't identify the authority that he speaks as coming from himself. He doesn't say to him, hey, Timothy, this is Paul. You know how great a guy I am. Now he comes to me and says, you know, Paul, I, I am an apostle. I am a follower. I've been sent from the Lord. My authority is from the Lord. That which I speak to you, that which I teach to you, that which I share with you isn't wisdom from me, but from the Lord who sent me. Paul doesn't hang his sound theological doctrine based on his authority, but on what God has to say. He talks about this calling, if you will. He says, I've been sent by the Lord according to the commandment of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus. And it is a calling. We use that term quite a bit. I mean, the, the whole idea behind being called to something is just saying that if you are called to something, I want you to think about something in your life that you just can't help but do. I could almost insert a yarn joke here, but I won't. For those of you that go to our church for a little while, you know that I just got myself in trouble again. There are, there are callings. I, you know, I've talked with, I, I was over at the Umpqua Community College yesterday at the graduating class for uh, Citizens Academy there. And there's a bunch of young people that just finished this class that hope to go on and become police officers someday. In about five years, I look forward to retiring from being a police officer someday. 
And I will tell you, I agree with the speaker who said that it is a calling to go and do something that you just can't help but do. Yes, police officers, why are you a police officer? And they'll tell you, I can't imagine doing anything else. Yes, somebody that serves the Lord, that preaches and teaches, especially, I mean, wow, that is really getting loud. <laughs> um, but you ask somebody that goes and preaches and teaches, and they'll ask you, why do you do it? And they'll tell you, because I can't imagine doing anything else. A calling is something you just have to do. Well, there's two sets of callings that come into this. 1 Peter 5.10 says, His divine power, it says God's divine power, has granted to us everything pertaining to life and to godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. God has called us unto himself. You know, I made that statement earlier. I said, you know, well, Timothy was nothing special, but you know, that's really not true, is it? In God's eyes, we are all so very unique and so very special. And God has called each one of you to be here today. It's not by no, no uh, uh, accident that you're here today. God has called you and given you this opportunity to be here, to be a follower, to hear the message and to speak God's word and to worship God and to sing praise songs. It's a calling. Well, that's God's calling on us, but there's also a calling that goes up as well because we also read in Romans 10, 13, that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So as much as God calls us, there's also a response that comes out of that. But we look to the Lord and we say, Lord, yes, Lord, I want that which you offer. I want to have my sins forgiven. I believe that Jesus is the son who died on the cross for our sins. And we call upon the name of the Lord. We enter into this family. We enter into this service. This service. We open into, I mean, it's kind of like, okay, you ever had to apply for a job? Remember filling out job applications? You fill those things out, you know, you'd go to your employer and they'd have this list, you know, of, of, of what the job looked like, the details of the job. I think as we look at our job, if we look at the, 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 the role of being a servant for Jesus Christ, being a worker for the kingdom of God, we often focus on the really good things like forgiveness from sin and newness of life and fellowship with God. We're no longer enemies of God if we accept the Lord as our savior. We have fellowship with this huge family of really good people. We have help from the Lord, we have help from the brethren. We have inner peace, we have calm, knowing that even as we live the last moments of our life, we are stepping into the first moments of eternity with our Lord and Savior. We have assurance in all things. Sounds pretty good, right? Who wants to sign up for the job? Me liking it? You know, if we read God's word, it could be written a little bit differently though also. This could be posted just outside of the synagogue on one of the pillars there. Wanted, men and women of all from every race, people, tribe of mankind immediate openings for the work of building the church. Workers will be misunderstood and misrepresented, sometimes even by those that they work with. Position includes making an immediate enemy of the forces of the earth and may include separation from lifelong friends and has the potential to divide families. Workers can expect to come under emotional, relational, personal, and even physical attack. Workers face the opportunity to lose their friends, family, jobs, finances, home, and possibly even their lives. Results and rewards for your work may not, seem, may not be seen for long periods of times or may never be realized in your own lifetime. Workers will receive a benefit package with an excellent retirement plan that will be received immediately after you die. Anyone want to sign up now? <laughs> Timothy got it. Timothy understood these things. He understood the risks and the dangers. He also understood the great blessings of being a child of God. That having our sins forgiven and having a relationship and being friends with the Lord, not to be an enemy with the Lord, was more important than anything else that we might risk or lose. And he was all in. He left everything behind, friends and family, underwent whatever was required of him to maximize his potential to serve the Lord. The Lord called him and responded. Paul's focus as he begins this letter to Timothy which is sure to have been read by some of the other leaders in the church also, is to assure Timothy of the authority of the message, and this even more so, to assure him that the Lord Jesus is our hope. Look there in 1 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope. You have to ask yourself a little bit, you know, what is hope? Paul says he's an apostle, that is one sent by the Lord. He says, okay, I've been, my message is from God. But he says, Christ Jesus is our hope. 
God's word has a lot to say about hope, but I want you to look here specifically in this verse and also in Colossians 1.27, that this hope that we have in Jesus are not only directly connected, they are one and the same. Paul wrote of the, to the church in Colossae, he said, of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit. This is Colossians 1, 25 through 29. He said, so that I might carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Paul says, you know, in days past, We didn't know what God's plan was, but now God is revealing his plan that the message of God, the love of God, the salvation of God, the promises of God are not just to the Israelites, not just to the Jews, but to Jews, Gentiles, to all mankind, to every nation, tribe, and tongue. He said, which is Christ in you. This is that great mystery that was being revealed. Christ is in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. You take those two passages and you put them together and you see that as we look at all the other passages that have to do with hope, they are all founded in Christ Jesus. In him alone we have hope for glory. And it's funny, really, because God created mankind to be in a relationship with him. From the time of the garden forward, man was created to have relationship with God. And God created it perfectly. And he looked at it and he said it was all good. And then man is the one that broke the relationship. Mankind is the one that turned our back on God. We're the ones that rebelled against God. We're the ones that, that broke this relationship. And now there's separation between us and God because we put it there. What hope could we have of fixing that relationship? Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, the prophet says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear, but your iniquities, your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Your sins have hid his face from you so that he does not hear. Maybe it's a little cliche, but we hear this saying, if you feel distant, if you feel separated from God, who moved? It is never God who walks away from us, but it is always us who rebels against God and creates that gap, creates that distance, creates that separation. And from the time of man's creation, the time that we rebelled against God, and all the generations of man that came after that, mankind has been trying, desperately seeking some way to have a relationship with God. And yet sometimes in our pride and our arrogance and in our desire to make it easier, we create gods that are more comfortable, more easy to serve. We fill it with gods of the air and the earth and and gods of the sea. We fill it with gods of unknowable realms and far off places that are easy to serve. All you have is some simple image and you got to go down and lay down something before it and all of a sudden all is well in the world. These false gods offer all kinds of ways you can earn your your way back into a relationship with God. And they offer all kinds of rewards at the end of your life because of this relationship that you've had with him. In the final act of desperation, mankind will even say there is no God, I am God. In the final act of arrogance, man will put himself on that pedestal and serve himself, declaring himself to be God, and in a relationship seeking the inner self. Acts 17, verses 26 through 28. This is God, God said, and he, God, made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and their boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and exist, and even some of our own poets have said, for we also are his children." God created every tongue, every nation, every tribe to be in a relationship with him, but we broke that relationship And even separated from him in arrogance and pride, man will say, I don't need God, I deny God. What hope could there be? What hope could man have to restore a relationship with the one true God? And seeing it as hopeless, they created false gods. But then one day, 
hope came into the world. When John the Baptist saw the man Jesus coming down, he was filled with joy. When John saw Jesus coming down to the water, he was filled with hope. He exclaimed in John 1, behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. What was it that separated us from God? Sin. And John saw Christ and he said, behold, the Lamb who comes to take away that sin. Behold, the Lamb who comes to restore their relationship. And he was filled with hope. Paul would proclaim to the Ephesians, in him we have redemption blood, the forgiveness of trespasses, according to grace. In Christ alone is their forgiveness. In Christ alone are these trespasses forgiven. Hope or helplessness, relationship or rebellion, lost or found, it is our choice. Mankind makes the choice in his heart how he will follow, whom he will follow, whether he will seek to restore this relationship through Christ or not. It's a choice. People say, well, I, just want to, I don't want to make a choice. That's a choice. Either we follow the Lord or we do not. Mark 16, verses 15 through 16 say this. Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and been baptized shall be saved. But he who has not believed shall be condemned. I love the but God statements where it's all going wrong and God steps in, says, you know, man was without hope, but God came and saved the world, right? We like those. There's another side to this, however. If man refuses to accept the Lord, refuses to trust Jesus, then man will be condemned. Hear me, church. If there's one thing you take out of this message today, understand that sin separates us from God and our only hope of restoring that relationship is in Christ Jesus. The Apostle John wrote in 1 John, verses 1 through 9, if, the, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Have you ever done a bad thing? We talk about this, you know, from the, the, the lowest of levels. We, you know, people say, you go up to them, you walk them on the track, are you a good person? Who is a good person? We'll go and we'll ask those who don't know the Lord, who don't have Christ as their Savior, and, we'll say, and they'll say to you, God's all love. He's going to let good people go to heaven. What's the problem? You are good enough. If we have ever lied, if we have ever stolen, if we have ever cheated, if we have ever spoke out and blasphemy against the Lord, if we've done any of these things, then we have sinned and broken the whole law. And if we have broken any portion of the law, then we are not all good. It took a perfect Savior to die on the cross for our sins. I had those very nice young men in their very nice walking through my neighborhood yesterday. I didn't get an opportunity to stop with them. I was on my way somewhere else, but I really wanted to have an opportunity to stop and share with them. How could a man have died on the cross for my sins to make any difference? Only God made flesh could accomplish what Christ did on the cross to forgive our sins. In him alone, we have hope. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Where there is life, there is hope. And Jesus said, I am the life. But to be very clear about this, in John 8, 24, the Lord said, therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Have you ever put those two verses side by side and thought about them? What a great hope we have in Jesus. What a great encouragement, what a great motivator this ought to be for us who have friends or loved ones who haven't accepted him as their savior because the outcome of that life is very clear. We earn for ourselves nothing but God's wrath by our words, by our works, by our schemes, by the works of our own hands. What hope does the convicted gossip, liar, thief, swindler, murderer, rapist have of being invited into your home? Anybody? You want to go down and grab the worst of the worst of humanity and invite them into your home and sit them down at your table right next to your children, right next to your spouse, right next to your mother, your grandmother. Not just for a visit, 
but to make them a part of your family. Who wants to adopt one of these people in and have them live with you in a full place of blessing as a part of your family for the rest of their life? Anybody? What hope does a person like that have of being brought into your family? Without the saving grace of God, through Christ Jesus, we have no hope. It's not my right means the forgiveness of my sins or grants me access to the kingdom of heaven. It's nothing that I did of my own hands, my own will, that brings about forgiveness for sins, restores that relationship, and can give me hope. In and of myself, helplessness and hopelessness is all I could possibly know as I seek glory. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 18 through 21 tells us this. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He gave that to us as well, the ministry of reconciliation. Now you may have never said to yourself, boy, I hope I can be a minister someday. And yet God has called each one of us to be ministers of reconciliation, to share the message of truth with the world, to share the message of hope with the world, starting in our own families, starting with our own children. Verse 19 says that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. If that doesn't give you hope, if that doesn't give you joy, man, you're missing something. Our sins, our wrongdoings, all that list of crimes that we have been committed, God does not hold them accountable to us. He does not reconcile them against us because of Christ. Because he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. I implore you to reach out to the world that doesn't know Christ yet, that they would be reconciled to God. Because a day of reckoning is coming. There will be a day when we all stand before that judge, we all stand before that throne. It's a great day to stand before that throne and to see the judge as your deliverer. It's a terrible day to stand before the judge and to see him as nothing more than the judge who will deem you guilty and wage against you the consequences of your sin, which is death. Verse 21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In Christ, there is hope. In Christ, there is joy. Jesus isn't just our hope, he's our only hope. And the good news here is that if we put our hope in Jesus, then our hope will be confirmed because God wins. It's in the back of the book, you can look it up. Understand that just as Paul began this letter to young Timothy, I thought we did pretty good covering two verses, or did we only get through one? All right, let's try two. I'm gonna stretch myself. Verse two, to Timothy, Paul says, this is uh, the second verse there in 1 Timothy 1, 2. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father and Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is what he gives over to Timothy. He says, Timothy, I want you to understand that with Christ as your hope, we have grace, mercy, and peace from God. God doesn't desire wrath on mankind. God created all things good for mankind. The wrath that comes is mankind's consequence for mankind's actions. We try and blame God for these things sometimes. It's just not fair. We try and say, well, God's not a fair God. God is a just God. And he brings about justice. To those who have neglected, rebelled, and turned their backs on him, he brings about that which is just for them. For those who have turned to him and accepted Christ as their savior, He brings about forgiveness because that is justice for them, according to his word. But God desires to extend his grace, his mercy, his peace on us through his son, Jesus Christ, the way to all who will follow. So let me finish with this. I know congregations love to hear pastors say that. Let me finish in Romans 15, verses four through six. Turn there with me, will you? Romans 15, four, four through six.
Again, unless you're driving. Don't open it up on your app and look at it there either, because that's cheating. And besides, all the cops can tell when you're doing it because you're driving down the road like this. <laughs> Romans 15, verses 4 through 6. Paul says, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Friends, we need to read God's word. Because in it, we find the lessons and instructions that God has given to us. And in it, we find hope. Verse 5 says, Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, as we come to the rest of this book, I again pray, Lord, that you will open our eyes. Lord, what is it that you want for us to learn here through this message as we read through it in the coming weeks? Lord, we thank you for the timeless truths that we find there, that in you, Lord Jesus, we have hope, we have confidence, and we can have joy. Lord, that in you we see forgiveness of our sins. We see the accountability of our trespasses removed from us and so unfairly laid on you, which creates in us a great desire to give back. Lord, you have sacrificed so much for us and quite honestly asked so little of us but to follow. So Lord, I pray that we would follow your way. I pray that we would dedicate ourselves to giving back to you. Lord, I pray that we would lift you up, honor you, and worship you as is rightly your position. Lord, we recognize and realize that there are those out there who have not accepted this way, have rebelled against this way, have turned their backs on this way, and are lost. Lord, for them, there is no hope without you. So Lord, I, help, I pray that you would help us to have the mind of, of Paul and the mind of Timothy, Lord, that we would be intentional about coming alongside those who need your help, that we would be willing to serve, eager to serve, eager to learn and to go. Lord, to you be all glory, all praise for all time. Amen.